1876, Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer was killed by Sioux in an event that has thundered down through American history. But three years earlier, the only general ever to be killed by Native Americans met his own fate. Due to the obscurity of this man in historical memory, I will attempt to give sufficient context for his paper. Despite the national indignation or condescension toward Native Americans, President Ulysses S. Grant pushed ahead a policy of peace during the early years of his, his, his administration. Yet prominent men like Grant's old friend, General William Tecumseh Sherman, were held in check by the President's peace policy. The, the Lieutenant General of the Army, Philip Sheridan, was also well known for his disdain of the Indians. So much so that popularly, newspapers referred to the contending views on the issue as the Quaker policy, which was Grant's policy, or the Sheridan policy. Very few could have predicted the location of the nation's dramatic event that damaged the tenuous support the Grant peace policy had. As far as US officials were concerned, the Modoc of the Northwest had long been tamed together with the state in which they had formerly lived, California. The Modoc, a tribe of Northern California and Southern Oregon, were among the first tribes subject subjected to a new reservation policy which emerged before the Civil War. The Modoc were moved into Oregon, and despite the policy of separate reservations for each tribe, they were combined with the Klamath in a reservation along the Sprague River. Their people were subordinated to the stronger Klamath tribe within the reservation, causing tensions, so much so that very few whites objected when the Modoc, the Modoc simply up and left the reservation and resumed living in their old homelands. Yet as the non-Indian population of the region increased, so did complaints about the Indian presence. The government anticipated conflict, and U.S. troops were moved to the region in order to enforce reservation policy. Brigadier General Edward R.S. Canby, commander of the Army's Department of the Columbia, led these soldiers who forced the Modoc into a stronghold in a region of lava beds along the border of California and Oregon. Canby was a spare, beardless veteran, well known to the public as a distinguished Civil War general, and to the Army as a kindly, courteous, accommodating gentleman with a wide circle of friends. Having served with distinction in the Western theater of the Civil War, among other things, he captured Mobile, Alabama for the Union. More people remember Admiral Farragut because of his damn the torpedoes, but Canby commanded the Army part of that operation. Having served with distinction for years, he can number Sherman and Sheridan among his friends, despite possessing a far more agreeable nature than either of his superiors. In fact, he and Sherman had somehow been friends for decades, despite Sherman's agita agitated nature and Canby being a very reserved, conservative person. He could also number among his friends several prominent East Coast politicians who became acquainted with the general during his service on staff duty in Washington where he worked as Henry Halleck's assistant general chief of staff and in helping to quell the New York City draft riots and enforce the draft in the months following them. Among those friends were Horace Greeley, the newspaper editor. Campy was widely regarded as a fine and decent officer and gentleman. The manner of his death, though, sealed the ultimate fate of the Modoc and severely threatened President Grant's peace policy, of which Canby was a dutiful proponent. Symbolic of this blow to the peace policy, General Canby was murdered by the Modoc chief, Captain Jack, at a peace conference held between the Modoc stronghold and the U.S. Army camp. Canby had been a warm supporter of the peace policy and wished to avoid a bloody fight. For this purpose, he built up his force to a thousand men, but also set a peace plan in motion managing to set up negotiations with the Modoc. Historian Robert Utley, in his history of, front of US Army regulars on the frontier, called Canby's policy compression. He was not willing to forcibly remove the Modoc, as Sheridan or Sherman would have preferred, but he attempted to utilize the proximity of soldiers in order to apply pressure on the tribe. This desire for peace that he expressed in this time was not a new trait in Canby's career. In the 1850s, he was responsible for the campaign against the Navajo. And in that, too, he expressed a personal interest in doing the utmost for the permanent and peaceful settlement of the Navajo trouble. According to Max Heyman in the only lone biography of the general that's ever come out, he should have known better than to make peace with the Navajos 
or at least he should have been more cautious in doing so. So great was his ongoing desire for peace with the Indians, though, that he was willing to perhaps throw caution to the wind and was maybe too naive for his abandonment. After he left New Mexico, troubles returned with the Navajo, and now he was again making a mistake in his effort for peace with the Modoc. His compression policy agitated the factionalism that existed among the Indians. Captain Jack was taunted and threatened by more belligerent members of his tribe, including one named Hooker Jim, who was wanted by the U.S. government because he had led a raid on Oregon settlers and murdered several of them. Newspapers tended to report the number in the hundreds. Can be reported it was 11. Captain Jack, though, was in a terrible spot, facing a direct challenge to his authority as chief and facing a war he did not desire. Hooker Jim called him a woman and vowed to disown Captain Jack if he would not kill the general in the next peace conference. Reluctantly, Captain Jack agreed. Canby intended the army to be a catalyst to a peaceful settlement of the issue. Instead, it proved to be the catalyst for his own demise. Unfortunately, good-natured and anxious for peace as he was, Canby could not believe the Modocs would attempt such a foolhardy act. When the time came for the fateful meeting, which was held on April 11, 1873, Canby arrived in his full-dress uniform, proud to finally have hope of achieving his desire for peace. The natives were antagonistic throughout the conference, though, and after Captain Jack made desperate final pleas for a permanent settlement within the Modoc ancestral homeland, which the general may have sympathized for, as he expressed in the conference according to the accounts of it, Captain Jack drew a pistol. The hammer clicked, but the weapon failed to fire. Canby stared at him in astonishment, and then the pistol fired and Canby fell back dead. Captain Jack stripped Canby of his uniform, which he kept for the rest of his life and actually wore in his war crime trials a couple months later. General Canby was dead, and the hope for peace died with him. Prior to news of the murder of Canby, newspapers throughout the country were optimistic about the hopes of peace, just as Canby had been. On April 12th, the day after he was murdered, the Eugene Register Guard of Oregon a Democratic paper which shockingly had not received news yet of Canby's death, printed reports from throughout the previous week, including telegrams from Canby, Canby to the East. They expressed that treachery was evident and we were momentarily expecting trouble in one article, yet in another article it contradictorily proclaimed, all quiet, and they will surrender unconditionally in a short time. Also on the 12th, the Memphis Daily Appeal of Tennessee discussed an April 7th telegram from Canby in which he discussed his views on the situation. Canby had sought assurance from authorities in Washington that any question of Indian criminal guilt, speaking generally about Hooker Jim's situation, the man who prompted his murder, would be determined by a federal court and not by the vindictive Oregon state courts which already wanted to kill all the Modoc they could. While expressing his willingness to support whatever the government's position was, Canby proclaimed, I think they should make such as to secure permanent peace, together with a liberal and just treatment of the Indians. The next day, the Daily Appeal printed the account of Canby's death. The report of the Daily Appeal is notable coming from the South. Southerners, as a group one might expect to celebrate the death of a former enemy after Modoc killed him, expressed mourning and thirst for revenge in concurrence with their counterparts in the North. A contributing factor to this likely was the even-handed treatment Southerners received at Canby's hands. Southern leaders like General Richard Taylor, the son of President Zachary Taylor, who had surrendered his army to Canby in May of 1865, joined in the chorus of grief that it was expressed about his death. Taylor wrote, he was a just, upright, and honorable man, and it was with great regret that I heard of his murder. The press, though, was less restrained than this son of a U.S. president. The aforementioned Memphis Daily Appeal reported the assassination of General Canby will exasperate the country against the Indian as never before. No such popular rage has ever resulted from any villainous deed of murderous, traitorous red men. A war of extermination must be begun. Even, even Grant's traditional fancy for braves will not prevent the execution of fearful vengeance upon a race of people. These assaults on Grant's policy were common throughout the country. The Daily Appeal ended this 
article by stating the Indian's doom was extinction from the hour that white men first exchanged whiskey for tobacco. Canby's death fills to overflowing the cup of wrath. Now, in these southern accounts, we can't discount another contributing factors for why they would want a general war against the Indians, as many asked for. They, at this time, 1873, was the height of Reconstruction, and there were thousands of federal troops stationed throughout the South. And a general war against all the Indians of the West would certainly require those thousands of troops to be withdrawn and Reconstruction to end. Only one Southern newspaper, though, expressed a contrary opinion, proclaiming this was the Athens Northeast Georgian. Captain Jack and warriors revenge the South by murdering General Canby, one of her great oppressors. Keep the ball in motion. Three, je three cheers for the gallant Modocs. Beyond this one paper, though, Southerners concealed their indignation toward Reconstruction and directed their fury at the natives. Calls for extermination came from newspapers throughout the nation, as did criticisms of the peace policy. The massacre was denounced on all sides as the worst, the worst faith ever yet exhibited by the worst and cruelest race of men that exist on this hemisphere, the Jacksonville Republican of Alabama reported. The peace policy, so called, was denounced in strong terms. In many papers, the death of Canby trumped other exciting events of the week including the Colfax Massacre in Louisiana, perhaps due to the more universal feeling concerning Canby's death and the controversy of race issues between whites and blacks. Far from Alabama, the New York Tribune took an almost identical approach to the issue. Its full cover on the 14th of April was devoted to the response to Canby's death, and the report continued on another page. Like most papers throughout the country, the Tribune echoed the calls for utter extermination of the Modoc. They also defended General Canby's decision to ignore warnings of treachery. The Tribune proceeded to laud the character of Canby, <coughs> proclaiming that his life was worth more than all the Indians in the land, and that they ought never to be given an opportunity to repeat such a deed as they have committed. Speaking of the larger issue of national policy, the Tribune stated Canby's death was the hardest blow the Indian peace policy has ever received and its friends are very apprehensive that in the revulsion of feeling that will now take place in the East and the increased clamor for extermination that will come up from the border will make it difficult to maintain the policy that the President has been attempting for about four years to introduce. The paper then applauded the order from General Sherman that no Modoc prisoners should be taken in the subsequent attack. One of the rare defenses of the peace policy, though, appeared in the New York Times. I have no sympathy for Captain Jack and his associate murders, and the fight for their extermination has my support, the reporter said. It is nonetheless true that the savage could probably say to the white man, in this case, with tenfold more truthfulness than did Shylock, the villainy you teach me I will profit by. For the very commencement of this Modoc war was a deed of trickery. Twenty years earlier, when the Modoc had first been placed on a reservation, it was after a peace conference with uh, with state officials, not with federal authorities, where in a massacre of Modoc leaders had actually been perpetrated. It is possible, historian Doug Foster wrote in an article, that the Modocs thought that peace meetings always ended violently. However, since this was not the first meeting between the chiefs and Canby and his fellow commissioners, and since violence had not resulted in any of the previous encounters in 1873, this is an odd theory, I find. Editors in the Midwest shared the general opinion of those in the Pacific, the South, and the Northeast. In Illinois, the Cairo Bulletin printed a grisly recounting of the events, of the events, which incorrectly stated that General Canby was not only scouted, but also quartered. The anxiety to hear the particulars has been great, the Bulletin reported, which was clearly true for newspapers throughout the region. However, like the New York Times, this paper held out hope for the peace policy. In Canby's home state of Indiana, the Jasper Weekly Courier reported on the status of the general's body and family. The funeral ceremonies on the 12th of April over General Canby and Commissioner Thomas, who was also killed in the event, in the camp were very impressive. The Weekly Courier expressed confidence that not an Indian shall be left to boast of having murdered General Canby. Several papers later passed along a tragic story from the June 18th issue of the New York Times, though, which reported 
Mr. C.G.C. Canby, brother of the late General Canby, died in the Missouri State Lunatic Asylum on the 9th instant. He was made insane by the tragic death of his brother and died from the effects of the shock. In Washington, President Grant and his administration almost certainly felt the extreme pressure to alter the policy that was coming from all sections of the country. The news horrified the people of Washington and cast a cloud from cast a cloud of gloom, especially over the officers of the army and the gallant officers, many new personal friends. It was a terribly difficult moment for the Grant presidency. The essence of Grant's Indian policy was under siege. Vice President Henry Wilson spoke of reporters and said the policy that peace with the Modocs is now completely out of the question and that they should be exterminated at any cost. This, was, this itself was a radical shift in position from Grant. However, Wilson clarified an important point that the administration wished to make known. The peace policy should not be abandoned in dealing with other Indian tribes. President Grant addressed the issue immediately also. The president, in conversation today, was reported, said there would be no hesitation in dealing with this band as their crimes deserved. But, as the but at the same time, orders for severity in their case are not to be interpreted as authority or license for war or outrage against the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Sioux, or other tribes who are all now peaceably disposed. Secretary of the Interior Columbus Delano, Delano supported this. He does not think this affair will permanently damage the so-called peace policy, the New York Times reported. It is not an object of the peace policy to deal with hostile Indians leniently. Its object is to protect Indians as long as they behave themselves. Sherman rejected this outright, as could be expected. No, sir, treachery is inherent in the Indian character, he said. Sherman hoped to emerge from a meeting with President Grant with harsh changes to the national policy, he said. But as Grant's own statements demonstrated, no drastic change was coming, despite the pressure. The death of General Canby struck the nation as few events had since the end of the Civil War. The Oregon Sentinel reported a popular opinion. Since the assassination of Lincoln, no news has created such intense excitement throughout the whole country as has the murder of General Canby and Police Commissioner Thomas by the perfidious Modoc. The policy of peace has been scattered to the winds, and war to the knife and knife to the hilt is what the Modocs may expect henceforth. Comparisons between the two assassinations are tenuous in retrospect, but at the moment they instilled similar feelings among the people. The popular response to the news, as represented by newspaper accounts throughout the nation, had a, pro had a profound effect on the debate over the peace policy. A week before Canby's death, the Jacksonville Republican had a prophetic article entitled Power of the Press. It lauded the press, quote, for exciting a helpful and beneficial influence in public and private affairs. Newspapers are more feared today in congressional halls and the high places of government than laws and courts and the stings of conscience and the thunders of divine wrath. God is a great way off, and the judgment awaits, but the ubiquitous reporter thrusts his sharp gaze. The fact that Vice President Wilson was forced within days to go on the defensive about the policy showed the immediate effect of the newspaper coverage. Ultimately, the peace policy would survive due to Grant's own coolness about the matter. However, the Modoc treachery had significant short-term impact on the execution of the policy. Kiowa chiefs in Texas were detained indefinitely, who were scheduled to be released prior to the event, and wounded Modoc prisoners were to be slaughtered on the battlefield. The distinction that was necessary for the survival of the policy was the separation of a single outrage by a group of Modocs from the general obedience of native of tribes of the West. General Sherman was clear that, left to his own devices, he desired to implement the utter extermination of all natives on the continent. However, Grant, who was well aware of the Army's own Lieber Code, which had been instituted during the Civil War concerning laws of war, was aware of the Code's uh, dealings on the issue of retaliation. Article 28 of the Code stated, Retaliation will never be resorted to as a measure of mere revenge, but only as a means of protective retribution and moreover, cautiously and unavoidably. That is to say, retaliation shall only be resorted to after careful inquiry into the real occurrence and the character of the misdeeds that may demand re retribution. The people wanted revenge, as newspapers showed. The army wanted revenge. 
The president, though, is aware of the military and government defined ter- limits of revenge. It would be sought tirelessly against the Modocs, but not against the myriad other tribes of the West. The cool head of President Grant was committed to the peace policy, and even an outrage as egregious as murdering a general under a flag of truce was not going to deter him from that vision. Biographer Jeffrey Parrott wrote of Grant concerning the Inflation Bill of 1874 that, quote, it had been a hard decision to make, not because of the pressure put on him by others, but because it tested his moral courage. He had done the right thing that was hard rather than the easy thing that was wrong. The same could be said of the handling of the Modoc crisis for following the murder of General Canby. He answered the critics of his policy that shouted from all sections of the country, as a president must or should. But his own will triumphed, as a president often does. And I'll now welcome any questions or comments. Which is easy to cover in his administration. But uh, this is one time when I think Grant did what could be respected. And uh, I know Brooke Simpson is coming out with a biography of Grant's presidency. He already wrote one about Grant's wartime years. And that's going to be a fairly positive assessment of Grant. Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 That's all right. <laughs>